we do get a chance for live questions, um, I'm going to ask everybody to keep them to a sentence or two, and um, and maybe only one question per person, so we have a chance to get to as many people as we can, if, in fact, that's what happens. But in the meantime, um, welcome to everybody, and hello, Tati, and um, tell us about this subject, about talking to children in a confusing world. A confusing world? You remember, um, what was his name again? Uh, Cain and Abel? They were sitting around thinking, what do we do in this confusing world? <laughs> but they were confused for a different reason. There was nothing going on. <laughs> So what, what, what's happening? What are we doing here? When was this world not confusing? Except that the confusion changes. Sometimes there's too much going on. Sometimes there's not enough going on. Always, always to our great surprise. Whatever it is, we never expected it. But I think in our time today, there is an unusual confusion. This is the mother of all confusions. Because everybody's confused, not just the children. Doctors are confused. Scientists are confused. Politicians forgot how to lie. They're so confused. <laughs> Everybody is confused. And that is, if you want to look for the silver lining, that's, that, that's a sign or a symptom that the world is ready for some, for some real significant changes. When everybody thinks they know what's going on, you get stagnation and conflict. I'm sure I'm right, you're sure you're right. Well, we gotta go to war. But when we both agree that we are confused, then we commiserate. We're all in the same problem, the same trouble together. But this is one of the predictions of the last of the prophets that before the coming of Mashiach, there will be great confusion. The leaders will take their instruction from their followers. Teachers will follow the demands of the students. Parents will run after their children rather than the other way around. Everything's gonna be upside down. And it is. Now, my parents, your grandparents, said the same thing about their generation. What's going on? Nobody. <laughs> Nothing like this. So, if everyone would simply admit that we're confused, we could get somewhere. We could make some progress. But you can't tell children, yeah, I'm also confused. That doesn't help. So what is left that we are still sure about where confusion cannot enter? This is where the Torah comes in. When human beings are totally confounded, you got to consult the word of God. Hopefully God is not as confused as we are. <laughs> Although okay, we, so, we can so be crazy. But. So in talking to children, you're saying, first of all, don't tell them that the world is not a confusing place. Even though our grandparents and great grandparents, every generation said about the next generation that it's going downhill in a handbasket, to mix metaphors. So we shouldn't be saying to our children, oh, this is nothing new. It's always been this way. No, it's confusing. 
but I am not confused or Yiddishkeit is not confused. When we're confused, we turn to something that is eternally, absolutely true. Not my thinking, not my opinion, not my take on the situation, but that which has always been old reliable. What have we always known to be true must still be true. So this is where we fall back on rock of the ages, something that has always been. Don't come up with a brand new concept or theory. We've had so many of them, it's, it's giving everybody a headache. No more theories, no more experiments. Tell me what has always been right and good and true. The good news is that because of this lockdown, because we're isolated and we have a lot of free time, this is where our minds are going. We're not busy, you know, busy with busyness. So we can think more clearly. It takes a couple of weeks, couple of months, all of a sudden your mind is focused. And what are we focusing on? What did, what did our grandparents have that we don't have? How did they survive what they survived? What were they just superior human beings? who could come out of a Holocaust and start life all over again? Was it, was it just a different breed of, of humans? No, they had something and we can have the same thing. And what that was, tradition, that which has always been and will always be. That's where our minds are going. And that's why people are reaching out to each other in simple human kindness. That has always been. That will always be. So when life is very confusing, do something nice. Do something good. There's our anchor. You wake up in the morning and you know you're going to do something good. You're steady. You've got some anchor. You've got some weight. You're not adrift. And it's so simple that it's almost scary. Uh, one would think that when you say we fall back on Torah, we fall back on what's always been true, many people would assume that the next word out of your mouth is we have simple faith. We have faith in God, we have faith that we're all in God's hands, and there's nothing to worry about. But you didn't say that, you said kindness. In other words, we have to do something about it. How do we get from there to there? Well, you, you can call it faith, faith in goodness, faith in truth, faith that there are some things that will never go away and will never become irrelevant. That's a leap of faith. So you can call it God, you can call it the mitzvah, you can call it common uh, responsibility for each other. But you went straight to do something, not just to sit back and have faith. Right. Well, have faith that what you're doing is true and real and eternal and, and safe. <laughs> liable. Now people say that when you're in trouble, when you're drowning, you'll grasp at straws. Not true. When you really need help, you don't grasp at straws. You can't afford to. It's like, hey, come on, this is serious. Stop with the straws. <laughs> like no cripple ever put their weight on a stalk of corn. They found a good solid piece of lumber and they leaned on that because they really needed support. So when the chips are down and the things get really serious, 
We don't grasp at straws. We find that which can carry our weight. So to trust and to know that an act of goodness, which really doesn't do anything for you, doesn't solve any of your problems and doesn't take away any of any, doesn't take away any of your confusion. You still don't know what's happening. <laughs> but you know what you're going to do today. That is so empowering. It's so real. So in a sense, you look at the Ten Commandments. That's like God's prescription for today's world. When everything is in flux, when nothing can be trusted, you can't really rely on anything. Be nice to your parents. That's the antidote. That's the prescription. If you're nice to your parents, you'll survive the storm. You'll outlast it. If you're honest, if you uh, don't covet your neighbor's donkey, <laughs> see, that's where it really gets confused. You're coveting your neighbor's donkey. Your neighbor is coveting your donkey. And they're the same donkeys. That's confused. <laughs> so the antidote is stop coveting. Stand straight, stand solid. There's nothing in your neighbor's yard that you need. This is the antidote. So what happens when my child says to me, you know, every time I ask you a question, your answer is do something kind for somebody else. You're in a bad mood, do something kind. There is a pandemic, do something kind. It's a confusing world, be kind. Yeah. Your message is when you don't know what to do for yourself, then do something for someone else. That's even better. So yeah, you can spend all your, try all your time trying to figure out, what can I do for myself? Well, either you'll figure it out or you won't figure it out. But even if you do, what's the great accomplishment? So you took care of yourself? That's nice. So here, here's the deeper, the deeper um, dimension to it. If I'm confused, if I'm uncertain, if I'm frightened, I always fall back naturally, instinctively, to the ultimate question, which we're often afraid to ask. Who needs this? I don't need this. If everything was stable and if everything was good, things are running along smoothly, fine, I'll go for the ride. But when things get crazy and I don't know what in the world's going on, who needs this? In other words, why am I here in the first place? Did I sign up for this? <laughs> Did anybody warn me that this is gonna be part of my life? I would have never agreed. So what am I doing here? That's a question we really should ask when we're not confused. But then we're too comfortable, we don't care. The ultimate question, what am I doing here? What is the purpose of life? Why do we wait until we're in trouble before we ask that question? So what you're saying to your child is this, we're confused. We don't like what's going on. We don't understand why this has to be happening. So we're questioning everything. Why be here at all? And if you're asking that question, there's only one answer. To do good. Not to survive. Not to take care of yourself. The question is, why take care of myself? The answer can't be, take care of yourself. So if I'm asking why am I here, the answer has to be for you. Because for me, I don't, I don't understand why I need this. So it's a real 
silver lining, maybe even a gold lining. And, and to, for so many people today, that's what's happening. We're answering the ultimate question. And if you want to put it in, in Jewish context, most of the time we're asking God, give me this, give me that, take care of this, take care of that, fix this, fix that. When we get to this stage of confusion, it turns around. And now all of a sudden it's, I, I don't even know what I need. Forget what I need. What can I do for you? I'm, I'm here for you. Tell me what you need. It's more interesting because what I need is making me crazy. So when the chips are down, and this has always been the case, it's, you know, in some way it's Viktor Frankl's psychology. Who survived in the concentration camps? Those who were needed by others. People who were totally focused on their own survival didn't do so well. He calls it meaning. The why. The why. And, and I'm calling it the function. If you know your function, if you know your place, you'll survive. If you don't know what you're here for and all you want to do is survive, you're on a treadmill. You're not going anywhere. I don't know why I'm here, so I have to survive. No, but I don't know why I should survive. Well, I got to survive. You're running in circles. You're going to get dizzy. So that's what you're saying to the children. When life is serious, when your mind is clear, when you're not distracted, the answer is always, who needs me? Of what service can I be? What do I need? It's not interesting anymore. That's good. Sometimes it's hard to say, you know, I say to my child, you know, be, be kind to others and, and you'll, you'll be happier. And my child says, uh, well, I gave him my toy. I didn't get anything in return. I'm not happy. How do we explain this to a child? Yeah. Wh where does this assumption I'm supposed to get something back? Where does that come from? It's called childhood. Um, well, the media, the the mentality of our generation. The confusing world? Yeah, even before. It's what's, what's part of what's causing the confusion. Like telling children that they deserve. Every child deserves an education. Every child deserves a happy home. Every child deserves a... No, they don't. Stop telling them that because they haven't done anything to deserve it. You wish it for them because you love them. There's no deserving here. That's a foreign concept. And look at what it does to kids. You deserve. Oh, you're not getting? That's so sad. But you do deserve. You're making it worse. Because if I don't get even what I deserve, whoa, life stinks. And that's what you're hearing a lot from kids. Life stinks. Why? Why does life stink? We're the most spoiled generation we can remember. Why does life stink? Because I don't have this. I don't have that. So? But I deserve it. You told me I deserve it. If I can't even get what I deserve, well, there's no justice. It's a very bad message. It's like saying, yes, you deserve, but life doesn't work. <laughs> what kind of message is that? But then what should I say? You should say you're a spoiled brat and you don't deserve anything. Before he becomes a spoiled brat. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. That's not exactly the words you use, 
but you teach children to be grateful right from the start, which is the exact opposite message of you deserve. No, everything you've gotten is for free. You should be very grateful. Life is for free. Health is for free. Everything's for free. An infant didn't do anything to deserve parents. There's no deserving. That whole concept is foreign in Judaism. Financially, economically, if you put in an hour's work, you should get paid for an hour's work. You deserve it. But that's strictly financial. Can't make deals with life because life is always for free. So gratitude is really the key to happiness. Everybody agrees on that. If you don't feel gratitude, you'll never be happy. Because everything I have, I deserve. Do I have to be grateful? I deserve it. And if I don't have it, I'm not disappointed. I'm outraged. What do you mean? Where is my new phone? Well, you don't have a new phone. Exactly. <laughs> Where is my phone? What, your phone? Yeah, the one I deserve. That was very funny, this advertisement for a hair product. And the punchline of the advertisement is, you deserve beautiful hair. I've been racking my brain. What does one do to deserve hair? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'll do it, just tell me. And how does that make bald people feel? See, that, that's nasty. You don't even deserve hair. <laughs> wow, what did you do? You must be the lowest of the low. It's a sick idea. Really, it's a disturbing idea. I deserve, I have it coming to me. No, no, you don't. None, nobody does. Life is for free, and we're already indebted up to our ears just for life itself. So that's really the message. The message really is life is not about you. Your life is not for you. And the best example is these guys who are now worth $200 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. These guys who owe, who own $200 billion, do they think it's all for them? You got to be an egomaniac. Because how could $200 billion be for me? I have no idea what to do with it. Even if I lived a thousand years. What am I supposed to do? Buy a, a country? Yeah. So if you, ha if you have $200 billion, you know it's not all for you. You don't have to be a genius or a tzaddik. Of course, it's not all for me. So imagine you talk to a guy. How much are you worth? $200 billion. What are you doing with your money? It's my money. Yeah, what are you doing with it? I'm keeping it, it's mine, under my mattress. <laughs> so you're a machine there. <laughs> so I think we actually do see some of the fabulously wealthy being very generous. Yes, they don't know what else to do with it. Same should be true with life itself. I have life. Yeah, what are you doing with it? Well, it's mine. What are you doing with it? I'm keeping it. For what? For me, it's mine. That's like keeping $200 billion under your mattress. It's craziness. I have love. Yeah, what are you doing with it? <laughs> I, I love myself. That's like talking to yourself. I speak very well. Who do you speak to? Myself. 
That's crazy. They'll take you away, put you in a padded cell. <laughs> Remember that joke about the guy who says, you know, yesterday I was talking to myself and I could tell that I wasn't being sincere. <laughs> yeah. You're talking to yourself and you're worried about whether you're sincere. Take them away. <laughs> Put him on some medication. Life is not for me, my life. Not my life. My body. It all the, it's my life, my body. No, it's not. Life is something you have in order to give. Love is something you have in order to give. Intelligence is something you have in order to share. We're not misers in any area of life. That's noble. That's purposeful. That's wise. We want our children to have at least a little wisdom. So when you hear children a constant my thing, my what, I need, I have, I'll get, I'll... Something's wrong. This is the kind of child who's going to grow up. He's going to get rich and have $200 billion and he'll sit on it under his mattress. And then wonder why he's miserable. But exaggerating, of course. But I was going to say, misery loves company and he won't be the only one because that seems to be the conventional wisdom. So how do you teach this to a child and then, and then explain that other adults, other prominent adults are not behaving this way? I don't think children care about that anymore. Those days when you know, your role model disappoints you and you're all messed up, nobody needs a role model these days. Okay. Children are so independent. They're way ahead of us. All they're lacking is some wisdom. They don't know what to do with their independence and with their intelligence. They're very smart. But very smart people get themselves into a lot of trouble if they're lacking the wisdom. So one of the practical things, you teach a child to say, thank God. Stop taking everything for granted. As if you created it and it's all yours. So I saw this little sign in a, in a Girl Scout camp. And Girl Scouts are pretty much closing down. So we rented this campground for our summer program. And in the office, there was a little sign that said, Wisdom is seeing a beautiful sunset and knowing who to thank. You don't know who to thank. You're lacking in wisdom. You don't think there's anyone to thank or any need to be grateful and thankful. Now you're in real trouble. So just teaching a child to say, thank God. We got home safely, thank God. Everybody recovered from the COVID, thank God. A little gratitude keeps you sane. That's something that a child can, can get their brain around. Gratitude is a big word, but saying Baruch Hashem, that's, that's practical. You know, after the devastation of the uh, Kozak rebellion and their, their murderous attacks on Jewish communities all over Poland and Ukraine, the Baal Shem Tov came on the scene. And one of the things he really invested a lot of time and effort in is to get people to say Baruch Hashem. And you would think you know, we've got bigger problems than that. 
Every community was devastated. Every family was grieving. There were some serious, heavy problems. And then there were some internal problems with the, the false Mashiach and Shabtai Tzvi. People were disillusioned. So they were getting bombarded from without, from within, spiritually, physically. And the Baal Shemta comes along and says, say thank God. They seem a little incongruous. It was exactly what needed to happen. You can sit there and lick, and lick your wounds endlessly, or you can start creating life where, where death had visited. Creating life means appreciating life, living it fully, being enthusiastic about life. That, that's what the devastation did. It took the enthusiasm out of life, and that's dangerous. So the Baal Shem Tev came along and said, what we need now is to really appreciate life. So say thank you. It had a marvelous effect. And that's another lesson. The little things, the little goodnesses, can fix huge evils. You don't have to have heroic, uh, superhuman activities. The little things, you know, like a microorganism can kill millions of people. A micro goodness can turn the world around. So, not, not to deprecate little things. You shared with your friend when he came over? That's huge. That's a big improvement in life. It's proactive, it's positive, it's generous. And if you do it enthusiastically, You're the solution, not the problem. So what if I feel like my kid has absorbed the wrong message? How do I begin to turn it around? I don't know, an 8, 10, 12-year-old, smart enough to think about it, but not ready or willing. Right, that's the problem. Questions always come before the answers. Smart enough to ask a question, not patient enough to listen to an answer. Um, if you really want to get ahead of the curve, you ask the questions. Put them on the defensive. Like, why are you here? Yeah. Because you told me to come down to dinner. And why aren't you eating? <laughs> <laughs> no, but if, you, if we ask the question first, and, and we're afraid to, you know, we always shy away from the big questions because we're not sure we have an answer. And then all of a sudden, your kid comes up with the question, well, wow, how did that happen? Who told you to ask that? <laughs> and now you're all defensive and flustered. And so first of all, it, it, you don't have to have an answer. You have to have a response. Like, what do we do when we don't have an answer? That's it, it's all over, we quit. Of course not, of course not. So you don't necessarily have to have an answer, you have to have a solution. Because to the child, it's not an academic question, it's a dilemma. More than an answer, they want an approach. What do I do when I don't understand? What do I do when things don't make sense? Throw a tantrum, just quit. 
that's where we play the, uh, the role model. But, but the point of it is this, you ask the question first. And even if you don't have the answer, so you share the question. It's good, it's healthy. What is an example of a response that's not an answer? Let's find out together. Why was there a Holocaust? I don't know. I have no idea. So what do we do? What do we do? For every loss of life, the response is make more life. So it's not like, if I can't explain why it happened, I don't know what comes next. I know what comes next. Some people are into death, I'm into life. So we know what the response should be, even when we don't know the answer. Um, Hopefully. I lost my car keys. What should I do? I don't know why you lost your car keys, but I know what you should do. <laughs> that's that's a, a very important uh, principle in life that children have to get. You don't have to answer the question. You just have to do the right thing under the circumstances. Because there are questions we'll never be able to answer. We still have to live. We still have to function. We have to stay the course and complete our mission. So that's the important thing. I gotta tell this story. <clears throat> when we first came to Minnesota, I started a class at the university in Tanya. At Mac or University of Minnesota? Minnesota. Two students showed up, two girls. For the second class, only one showed up. Turns out her name was Friedman. We weren't related, but. Anyway, she stayed and we studied and she came to Chabad house, started keeping kosher, started keeping Shabbos and her mother got interested. Her father eventually went along, not, not enthusiastically, but he went along. <laughs> she had a sister who was away at a university out of town. The father suddenly passed away. And the sister came home, of course. And here are all these rabbis taking care of the funeral. And she was not used to this. She wasn't there when her family became observant. So she was very upset and let it be known. Anyway, one of the days of Shiva, I was sitting next to her. And she said, I know I was a pain in the neck, wasn't I? But you got to understand, this is all, it caught me by surprise. What's going on? What's with this, with this, with these, with these rituals and with these customs and with the, all of a sudden rabbis are deciding how we should do things. But I got to tell you, looking back at it, I am so pleased to know that my father was buried the right way. I don't know what makes this the right way, but it feels so good to know that my father was taken care of properly. That is such a wise insight. Don't explain to me why you have to have a simple wooden casket. Don't explain to me why you, I don't care. 
If that's the right way, thank you. Because what's really important? The explanation or knowing that it's right. Kids got to learn this. They're bright and they can ask the questions. They don't realize that they're more important things. So if we could distill gratitude down to Baruch Hashem, thank God, for a child, for um, and we can distill appreciation for life into doing something for somebody else. How would you distill that? Knowing the truth is better than understanding it, is more important than, than a deep dive into the philosophy. How do you say that to a child? The reason we ask questions is because we want to get to the truth. Not to show how smart we are. We want to understand because hopefully that'll lead us to the truth. If I already know what the truth is, then the questions and the conversations are academic. I know the answer. For some people, once I know the answer, stop with the philosophy. And they're right. The point of philosophy is to get to the truth. If you know the truth, why are you wasting your time? Splitting hairs, making arguments. So what was that story about the previous Rebbe when he was a little boy, his father told him how to say Mauda'ani. You sit up, you put your hands together and you say Mauda'ani. And the little boy said, why? The father said, I really shouldn't answer you. That was out of line. But I once told you to come to me with all your questions, so I'm committed. So I'll answer this also. But in way of, of in lieu of an answer, the father, the previous Zebbi's father, called in the old man who was the attendant in the house. He was in his late 80s. And he said to him, how do you say Maudani? He said, you sit up, you put your hands together, you say Maudani. Everybody knows that. So the Rebbe's father said to him, why do you do it that way? And this old man said, it's how my father taught me to do it. And the father said, thank you. When he left the room, his father said to the little boy, to the previous Rebbe, he has lived through three czars. He has had all the experience of life for 80 some years. And to him, it's enough. His father told him, this is how you do it. So that's how he does it. You're six years old. And your father tells you this is how you do it. And that's not good enough for you? What was the point? What was the message? The message was, and, and, and the Rebbe got it, and he wrote it in his diary. You want to know why we say moda ani that way. In other words, you want to know what makes that the right way. What's more important, the fact that it's the right way or what makes it the right way? So if you were wise, you would say, oh, that's how you do it, okay. Why is that the right way? Now you're a smart kid. But if you're checking, what makes that the right way? You missed the point. You missed the point. The point is I just gave you the most important piece of information. This is how it's done. 
That is the most important piece of information. Now, if you're really into it, and you even want to know how it became the right way, you're a smart boy. But if you simply dismiss the fact that it's the right way, that's not interesting. You're not, you don't care about that. You want to know why. Why what? Why is it the right way? That's how you get to the right way, and I've already given it to you. So the first thing we have to appreciate, right is right, true is true, it's awesome. Sometimes we can even figure out how and why that's the right way. But like this girl said, I don't know all these things about Jewish burial, but I guess it's the right way, so I'm really happy. Okay. Do we expect children to be able to, to perceive that difference? Yeah, because you ask a child, how do I get online with this computer? And the kids say, hey, you do that. You push this, you do this, that, that, and that's how you do it. And you say to the child, why? And the child will say, just do it. It works. <laughs> so they do know. But I live in a world where my kids have met people with me who are as sure about their whatever Narish guides as, as I am telling my kids about the truth. Oh, that's good. That's actually progress. When you have two people who have a tradition, who have a claim to truth, who know what they claim to know what they're doing, and, and they're not the same. This is, this is wonderful. This is the richest and best part of life. That's a great conversation to have. But when all people talk about is a theory about this and a theory about that, just get a headache and it's, it's, you go nowhere. So yes, when there are claims of truth, you have to work it out do a little detective work and figure out which one is really the truth and which one is a little distortion. Or they're both true. They're both true. And then the question is, which, which one is more relevant to your life right now? So um, confusion that comes from intelligence from knowledge. I know a lot, and many of the things I know are in conflict with each other. That's, that's learning. That's great stuff. But when I'm confused because I know nothing, that's not good. So you should welcome that. When a kid comes home and says, my, my friend says that this and this is truth. Oh, okay. Let's examine that. Anyway, this whole thing is really an interesting conversation, but it's not particularly relevant to your kids. Your kids are absolutely delightful. And the most beautiful part about it is they're uncomplicated. Well, thank you, but sometimes... It's a breath of fresh air. Sometimes the challenge is, even if a child is on the same page, now how do, how do they learn to agree to disagree with others with respect when it seems that nowadays you're either with me or you're against me? That's a whole nother conversation. What happened to respect? Yeah, very interesting. Just recently I heard that there was a study done 
32 years, this sociologist studied this group of couples for 32 years. And you know what conclusion she came to? It's published, you can look it up. I forget her first name, Dr. Keller, K-A-L-L-E-R. She came to the conclusion, you ready for this one? Love is not what keeps couples together. Isn't that shocking? Not if you've been on this program before. <laughs> Don't you remember that song, Love Will Keep Us Together? That wasn't true? <sighs> How shocking. And what's even more interesting is what she discovered that does keep couples together. Respect. That came out of left field. Nobody expected that one. Respect. Haven't read a single article on, in all the advice columns and all the books on relationships. Never saw that one. Respect. <laughs> what is this, the 1800s? The couples who have mutual respect thrive. Love often sours the relationship. Instead of keeping us together, it tears us apart. So we got to get back this talent called respect. Obviously, if somebody is highly advanced and superior, he'll get respect. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the respect that is offered. You offer respect. It's a gift. You don't wait for your spouse to do something so impressive you can't help but respect them. You're saying that respect is not earned? It, need, it need not be earned. It's a nasty attitude. Oh, I'll respect you. Just, you know, impress me. You do something worth respecting and I'll respect you. That is so disrespectful. <laughs> All right, there are teenagers say, oh, my parents don't respect me, so why should I respect them? Because they gave birth to you? Yeah, so... Well, if that's not impressive, I don't know what, what can they do to impress you more? Now, respect should not be, should not be a condition. We respect people because they're people. There's a certain common decency. We respect life, we respect humans just for being human, not for being exceptional. Particularly with couples, because there is so much truth to that, um, to that saying, familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, who is more familiar than a married couple? How do they avoid breeding contempt? So respect is that shield that prevents the familiarity from turning into contempt, which is worse than hate. If you hate me, at least you talk to me, scream at me, something. Contempt? I'm completely out of your world. I don't exist for you anymore. That's, that's intense. So, children really need to learn respect. We did not, I got to tell you. Nobody taught me respect. 
it wasn't really necessary because I was so dependent on my parents. I couldn't do anything without them anyway. Respect or no respect. That was the reality of life. A 10-year-old couldn't get on a bus. The bus driver said, where are you going? Where's your mother? The truant officer, remember that? I've heard about that, but I don't. Yeah. Right. It's past your bedtime. What are you doing out on the streets? And who ever heard of, a, of an 11-year-old with a, with a credit card running around the mall? unsupervised was unthinkable. So we didn't need to respect our parents. We couldn't budge without them. So today when children have more independence, now they need to learn respect. But nobody teaches it. So it's a hard concept to teach. So let's say this, I need, I need baby steps. We spoke about gratitude and saying, thank God. We spoke about understanding that life is a gift and it's meant to be passed along, kindness for others. And we spoke about respect and inculcating respect and, and especially, as you say, the kids are the technological natives and we are the technological immigrants. They, they don't not, not only they don't need us, sometimes it's the other way around. So what are some things that I could do today and anybody could do today? The kids come home from school. What do I start with? What are some baby steps with these three ideas? So I have two stories. Um, in the early years in Minnesota, I went to visit a family to invite them to come for a Shabbaton at Chabad House. We were promoting a Shabbos program and I was going around inviting people. So I went to this family in Minneapolis to invite them to come for Shabbos. We were sitting at the table and the 12 year old girl came in and in typical American fashion, dad, are we going or not? That sound just like, grated on the ears. I never heard a kid talk to their father like that. Like, what am I gonna do with you? <laughs> Total reversal of roles, huh? The father said, ask your mother. The daughter said, I asked her, she said to ask you. And that was like too much for me. And without thinking, I said, you don't refer to your mother as she. This girl gave me this look like, who are you? <laughs> who invited you to this conversation? <laughs> so I said, I'm sorry. No, no. Anyway, she, she walked out. Later that evening, the father calls me back and says, I want to thank you for what you did this morning. I said, what I did? I invited you to come for Shabbos. Are you coming? He said, no, 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 no. What you said to my daughter. I said, yeah, that was way out of line. <laughs> he says, you don't know what that did. My son came home. He's 11. And I heard my daughter say to my son, you know, you're not supposed to say she about mom. The whole atmosphere in the home has changed. We've become a family. Just from that. The balance, you know, the, the totem pole, the hierarchy in the family, it all straightened up and suddenly they're a family. There's a mother and she's the mother. There's a father, there's a daughter, there's a son. They're a family. The other story is that there's this little book called Blessings of a Skinned Knee. You know the book. A sociologist 
a child psychologist, wrote the book. And the punchline very briefly is that when she went to school, she was told that her clients, her patients, will be children from dysfunctional families, broken families, and disadvantaged families. And so the children have issues. Now she's been practicing for almost 12 years and none of it is true. Her clients are not from broken families and not from disadvantaged families and not from dysfunctional families. The dysfunctional families don't go for help. <laughs> the um, disadvantaged families can't afford her price. <laughs> and uh, what was the other one? Dysfunctional, disadvantaged, and ah, whatever. So now she doesn't understand. Why do these kids have issues? Now the broken families. It really puzzled her. And she felt like she was inadequate as a counselor if she doesn't understand where the issues are coming from. So one day she's sitting at her synagogue's adult education class and they're studying the laws of honoring parents. Everyone should study this. We know the Ten Commandments, but what are the details? What is the application? For the first time in her life, she heard that you're not allowed to sit in your father's chair or your mother's chair. And a light bulb went off in her brain. She said, that's it. That's it. From then on, the beginning of all therapy with every one of her kids, her clients. Do you sit in your father's chair? Don't. The, the, um, the, the, the results, the effectiveness of her treatment has vastly improved. And the theory behind it is this. You sit in your father's chair, your dog sleeps in your bed. Your dog sits in your father's chair. You sleep in the dog house. <laughs> Do you know who's who, what's what? Do you have any borders in your life? As soon as you tell a child you can't sit in your father's chair, you've solidified his identity. Now he knows he has a father. Now he knows he's somebody's son. You've given him an anchor. He's already healthier and more sane than he was before. Anyway, when I first heard this, I thought, yeah, well, that's it, uh, yeah. I didn't get into the details, explanations. Of, yeah, sure, much healthier if you don't sit in your father's chair. Not long after that, this mother asks me to talk to her 11-year-old who's out of control. So I said to him, do you sit in your father's chair? He says, yeah. I said, that's a problem. He says, why? I don't know. <laughs> it just sounded like, yeah, that should be a problem. So I, I didn't know. I said, okay, so uh, does, does, your, does your dog sleep in your bed? Yeah. I said, that's a problem. He said, why? I don't know. Just sounds. If you came home from baseball, you're carrying a bat and you walk into the house and your father and your dog are killing each other. Who are you going to hit with the bat? You know what this brilliant kid said? And I'm sure most kids in America would say the same thing. He says, it depends who started it. See, justice. 
It depends who started it. I said, you are one sick puppy. <laughs> like, now I know what's wrong. You have no definitions. Your father, your dog, you don't know the difference. You don't know the difference. How could that be healthy? Your foundation is, sh is shaky. So how do you teach respect? In practical application, not in theory. One does not sit in a parent's chair. It's not respectful. One does not refer to parents by their first name. One does not refer to parents by he, she. It's just not respectful. First time I heard a teenager say to her mother, Ma, you're so stupid. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair. How is that acceptable? That's jungle behavior. And one final story. I had a great uncle. You probably never met him. Fetachayim, my grandfather's brother. I feel like I met him. He was a very, very special, gentle soul and a very sad life. They never had children. His wife had a serious mental illness for many, many years. And he took care of her to the end. And when she passed away, he would come to our house for, for dinners. We had a tiny little apartment in Brooklyn and he hardly ever spoke. And when he did, it was a whisper. One day we're sitting at the table. My mother was standing right behind me, between me and the sink, and there was very little extra space there. And I put my hand up over my shoulder and I said, Ma, can I have a spoon? This gentle man went ballistic. He turned purple and he shouted at me in Yiddish. Using your mother? And then, and then back to his quiet self. And that, that made such an impression on me that from that time on, every time I came home to visit my mother and she would say, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> I'll get it myself. Fetah <laughs> was so was so shocked. You need a spoon, you get up and get your own spoon. You don't use your mother as a shortcut. She's not there to serve you. Honoring parents means you serve her. You get up from the table and bring her a spoon. Asking your mother, it was, it was he, he literally, genuine, could not believe that a child could be so disrespectful and so insensitive. You've also just demonstrated another thing. Not everybody knows or has met Fetter Chaim, but every time you've told that story, it makes an impact. So even telling stories about people who are respectful breeds respect. So there is a lot, this is a good thing this was recorded because there's a lot to think about, a lot to hear and um, a lot to review and a lot to do tonight at dinner. And if you institute any one of these little practices that seems so insignificant, don't say she 
if you're talking about your mother. That's it. You've changed the whole dynamic. You've changed the atmosphere in the home. Yeah. Wow. Wow. With God's help. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. I apologize. We ran a little over time and I did not get a chance to take questions from the floor, although we sort of fielded some of them as we went along. But um, that was a very, very important conversation. Thank you for setting it up and making it happen. And let's do this again. Who, who did set it up? Your guys. Your people spoke to my people. Mm. Respectfully, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> It was very, very nice. Thank you, thank you. Zai Gizun, thank you everybody. And um, God willing, we'll, we'll do this again. And now I'm gonna go show this to my kids. Thanks, Da. How's the, how's the weather by you? It, uh, it, it had its, we had our annual freak out because it snowed a, a, a smattering. Um, and now life is back to normal and there's no remnant of the snow. Beautiful. Thank God. We got, my kids tried to go slam from Minnesota, so 